This Atari STE has a couple of dodgy controller ports that need some attention. You can see here as I wiggle the mouse wire, the pointer is moving on the screen. I never owned an Atari ST of any description in the 90s. My 16-bit weapon of choice was the big rival to the Atari at that time. I won't say its name here, rhymes with Amoeba. But I grudgingly admired them from afar. Very afar. Nobody I knew owned an Atari. I'm not sure if this was a deliberate action on my part to ostracise anyone on the wrong side of the 16-bit fence. Possibly. I spotted this Atari 520 STE on Snakebook Marketplace at a price I really couldn't resist. The recent acquisition of three Ataris all in just over a week, three lovely 2600s, must have diluted my old feelings of distaste for the Tramiel bread machines. Now it sounds like I'm not an Atari fan, and there is a kernel of truth in that, but there are things I really like about the Atari 520 STE. For instance, the bulletproof RF shielding inside. It's an insane amount of metal, giving literal armour plating. I can only imagine the design meeting where this was discussed must have included the phrase must be able to withstand a direct lightning strike whilst being run over by a truck. Also, the aesthetic. Its rival, that shall not be named, was and is a decent looking wedge of beige. But the Atari had some flair that left us Commodore fanboys green with envy, even if we wouldn't admit as much. There are also things I really don't like about the Atari 520 STE. The plastic used hasn't aged well. I've eaten prawn crackers with more structural integrity. And the RF shielding. This appears in both the good and the bad column on account of it being sharp enough to slice time itself. If you open an Atari, be wary or be prepared to lose a digit. My biggest dislike is the one that has shamed Atari diehards over all these years. Yep, the placement of the controller ports. What were they thinking? It isn't so much that they put them underneath, literally the most inconvenient place it's possible to put them, or even that the cables run out the front of the machine instead of the back. It's not even that plugging a mouse or a joystick into the ports is actually that difficult. No, it, the fun starts when you want to unplug something. The recess is just big enough for the two plugs, but not quite big enough for you to get your fingers inside at the same time. Your options are limited to yanking the plug out by its cable, Something that must have been done to the only mouse I have for this machine, judging by its intermittent performance and probably broken wires. Or you have to lever the plug out with brute force, or a screwdriver. The placement isn't the only problem. The ports are actually mounted to the underside of the keyboard PCB, with a minimal amount of structural rigidity to prevent the ports being bent and twisted when a plug is removed or inserted. The pins at the back of the ports are bent at right angles and are soldered onto the other side of the PCB with very little solder on each joint. So lateral force against these weak joints can cause them to weaken and crack. In this case, almost every single solder joint on both the joystick ports had given up. On port 1, the port that can take a mouse or a joystick, all the pins are intact and seem to be okay. So all I needed to do here was reflow the solder, adding more than Atari could apparently afford at the time of manufacture. On port 2 there are problems with the pins being misaligned, so I decided to remove the port to make it easier to work on. I added fresh solder to each joint. Notice the bottom right pad isn't cracked. Unusual. As I add solder to it, the pin does a disappearing act. When I apply the solder sucker, it does such a good job it sucks the broken pin right out. By the way, I'm using an Engineer Made in Japan solder sucker, as seen on Gadget UK. It's a little more expensive than your regular nylon tipped sucker, but I can't recommend this enough, it's simply superb. A little lever with a grimy fingernail and the remaining solder breaks away with minimal force. You can see where the broken pin has come from, so I'll need to work out a way of repairing that. Constant yanking against the port has made this pin shear right off. I decided to use an axial capacitor leg from a Spectrum service to replace the broken port leg. It's slightly thinner than the original leg, around 0.5mm compared to 0.6mm, but that shouldn't make too much difference. It'll still be stronger than the remaining ones. I started by filing the top of the pin flat and counterpunching a small mark as close to the centre as I could eyeball. 
The smallest drill bits I have are the 0.4mm ones I use to clear clogs on my 3D printer. This should give me a good starter hole. Okay, it turns out 0.4mm of tungsten carbide is not very strong. Who'd have guessed that? I have spares though, and taking it slower with a little bit more drill speed helped. I then switched to a 1mm bit. This is a little bigger than I would have wanted, but it's the smallest I have that will work for this. Sorry, forgot to press record for the soldering part. Basically, I soldered the capacitor leg into the hole I drilled. See, you didn't miss much. Off camera, I trimmed some of the excess solder off with a knife and then inserted it back into the housing ready to refit to the PCB. A full size hammer here would be too much, so I'm using an electrician's hammer instead. It's difficult to grip this in the vise without breaking the plastic, which is the last thing I want. And it's in. I'll leave the leg long until it's soldered in place. A very satisfying fix. Before I can put this back together for testing, I need to repair some of the Rice crispy screw mount pillars that fell off when I took the screws out. All of the broken ones were at the same end over the left hand side of the machine. No surprise, they're the ones right over the power supply. Putting the power supply inside, was that a good idea? I suppose if you wanted to use the machine as a boat anchor, it helped along with the girders they put inside for the RF shielding. Would make a great anti-zombie weapon too, but was a power brick really that inconvenient? I actually quite like the Amoeba power supply bricks. I think they have a certain charm. I used to turn mine off with a toe under my desk. Happy days. I clean up with isopropyl to remove anything that might interfere with the glue bonding. I'm using my favourite cyanacrylite with a spray activator. It just works really well on almost everything and the convenience of having plenty of working time to get the part into position and then being able to cure the glue instantly with the activator is just marvellous. Some of the other posts were cracked. I dabbed a little glue onto the cracks to help prevent them splitting further. Is that a memory chip escaping from the Atari? A blast with compressed air dries out the activator and we are ready to put this back together. Or we would be. Now I need to get all of the rubber domes back into the top half. I'd better speed this up for you as it was pretty tedious. Once the domes were off the keyboard PCB, I gave that a light clean with isopropyl too. A few minutes of carefully putting the screws back in the base without cutting new threads. Thank you for that tip, Mr. Mark Fixes stuff. And we are ready to test. The mouse port now works a treat. I will claim there must be something wrong with the joystick port. Why else would I suck at this game? And that's it for now. It's nice to be back making videos again and I hope you don't mind my small change of direction. There will be a wider mix of things being built and repaired going forward that I would like to share with you. If you'd like to keep up with what's going on in my workshop in a more up to date way than waiting four months for me to release the next video, don't worry the next one is already mostly done then follow me on Twitter at ZZLeeZZ. Appropriate social media links are in the video description. Thank you for watching.